On the southeast corner of Bluer and Bay was a building bearing the name Bay Bluer Building. Saul Mendelssohn operated his radio shop on the Bluer side. The design of the building was typical of a New York building that tends to dominate a block, challenging the adjacent properties to join in to make a mega block. This anchor building never expanded and was later torn down for the Manulife Center with its tall towers and underground retail complex. Saul Mendelssohn moved his radio shop inside the retail complex to an entrance on Bay Street. Occasionally, an eastbound single Bluer car running behind schedule in the late evening would be diverted south on Coxwell and over the Carlton route to Bay Street, then north on Bay to Bluer, returning to its regular eastbound schedule. Before the Young subway was built in 1954, the intersection of Bluer and Young was extremely congested with riders transferring between the two lines. When planning the alignment of the Young subway crossing Bluer Street, allowance had to be made for the transfer of riders between the subway and the Bluer cars. In the early 1950s, temporary track was laid around the area where the platforms were to be built so that regular service on the Bluer line could be maintained. Operators were instructed to use caution in this construction zone as there were two tight curves on either side of the zone that if not taken at reduced speed might derail the car and at the very least jolt the riders. The transfer platforms were long enough to accommodate two MU trains one end of the platform being used for unloading and the other for loading. Canopies were built to protect riders from the elements. Later, the canopies had to be raised when it was found, quite by accident, that there was insufficient clearance for large widths. Two loaders were stationed on each platform during the PM rush hour to assist riders boarding the trains. It would also be his job to inform the operator when to close his doors. Two large mirrors were positioned so that when the loaders were not present, the operator could have a clear view of the rear doors. It took a while for automobile drivers to get used to the transfer way. Some of them would sail through oblivious to the do not enter warning signs. Streetcar service on Church Street was replaced by buses in 1954 when the Young Subway opened. Transit travel on the street continued to decline to a trickle. The TTC abandoned bus service on the street in the late 1990s. On weekends when the portion of Bloor Street east of Sherburn where the subway crosses to the north side was closed for subway construction, westbound Bloor cars would divert up Church from Dundas Street. The combined service of Bluer trains and Danforth trippers was on a one-minute headway between Luttrell and Bedford Loop. Automobile traffic would sometimes cause the trains to bunch up. During the construction of the Mount Pleasant extension, shoe fly track was built on the south side of Bluer around the rear of two houses and out again from Huntley Street to Bluer. There was a large passenger flow at Jarvis Street in the heart of Insurance Road. 
In the a.m., office workers would jump off my car and head for the coffee wagon on the corner for a morning cup. In the afternoon, they were out again, buying tickets on the cars with five and ten dollar bills. Just to the right of here in the 1920s, streetcars ran on an off-street private right-of-way between Parliament and Sherburne. In 1932, the roadway was widened and the tracks relocated in the center of the road. When these movies were taken, wooden decking for the pedestrian access to Sherburne Station from the Glen Road Bridge had been installed. The decking covering the subway construction connecting Sherburne Station to the Rosedale Valley Bridge was also laid, permitting traffic to proceed uninterrupted. Sherburne was the only station on the line that was located south of Bloor Street. At Parliament Street, temporary wooden passenger islands were built. This was made necessary by the increased number of MU trains on the line and the increased automobile traffic, making it hazardous for riders alighting from the cars. After the young subway was opened in 1954, Danforth trippers no longer ran downtown by way of Parliament Street. They now continued west to Bedford Loop. The Viaduct Loop, which opened in 1924, was located on the southeast corner of Parliament and Bloor. It was the northern terminus of the Parliament car line. During the Canadian National Exhibition period, it also served as a short-turn loop for King Exhibition cars. The Parliament route operated from Danforth Car House, and it was a rare occurrence to see an MU car on this route. The architecture of this shelter represented the style of the period. It blended in with its surroundings, and it had a sense of permanence that is not evident in shelters of today. During the construction of the Sherburne Tunnel across Bloor Street in 1963, streetcars were diverted on weekends while work was being done. The routing for westbound cars was south on Broadview, west on Dundas, north on Parliament, west on Carlton, and north on Church to Bloor. Eastbound routing originally was down Spadina, but soon was changed to south on Bay, east on Dundas, and north on Broadview to Danforth. Castle Frank Station is one of the more pleasantly designed stations on the line. It was designed to blend in with the surrounding area. When it opened, it became the terminus of the Parliament and Wellesley buses. During the annual three-week Canadian National Exhibition, King Exhibition cars ran from Coxwell and Danforth via Parliament to the c &E Eastern entrance. A large white card reading via Parliament was placed in the front window. Prior to the introduction of MU operation on Bloor Danforth, the transit union objected to the TTC's proposal to pay the man on the second car a conductor's wage. During the first few weeks of service, the 4400 series cars ran as single units until the matter was resolved. It was explained that it was more practical for the second man on the train to be paid as an operator, as conditions could require him to operate the second car as a single unit. The Prince Edward Viaduct was opened by the Prince of Wales, who was the first to drive over the bridge in 1919. It was opened to streetcars in 1918. The designer of the bridge allowed for a lower decking for a proposed rapid transit line. The section of the line between Broadview and Castle Frank was the longest distance between car stops on the route. Along here was an excellent opportunity to show the speed capabilities of the PCC as the cars were not subject to speed limits. It allowed operators to regain a little lost time. 
The average time for a run from Luttrell to Jane was 65 minutes, but this time increased considerably in rush hour traffic. Subway construction occupies a vacant lot on the northwest corner of Danforth and Broadview, where once a small traveling carnival would set up rides and games during the summer months. During the final days of operation, track maintenance along Danforth deteriorated. I can recall some fairly rough spots along the line, which gave an interesting ride for everyone. Danforth Avenue was the eastern terminus of the Harvard car line. The original loop was located on Pape, just north of Danforth. In the mid-1920s, it was proposed that the loop also be used as the southern terminus for a Leaside car line, and a short stretch of double track was laid on Pape. Construction of the Pape subway station forced the relocation of the loop. Two houses were demolished to provide space for the right-of-way. The cars now exited onto Gertrude Place. The connecting buses looped around the block. While the west part of town on Bloor Street was made up of Ukrainian, Polish, Italian and Portuguese, the east part of town along Danforth was Greek and Macedonian. Ethnic diversity along most of Toronto's car lines still exists, even today. When MU cars first arrived on the property in 1949, operators were shown the unique features of the cars, including the drum switches for activating the couplers, emergency reset switches, different positioning for the dead man pedal, and trolley pole dewiring buzzer. It only took a day of training to familiarize the operator with the car's features, plus a one round trip on the line with a private car. A year after acquiring 75 second-hand cars from Cleveland in 1952, they were equipped for multiple unit operation on the Bloor Danforth line and the Danforth Tripper. While differing in appearance from the operator's point of view, they were all the same. The different car models were still interchangeable with one another in MU service, although being built by three different manufacturers. This showed the versatility of the PCC design. These Pullman-built Cleveland PCC cars ran for a small number of years in the Queen City. They were equipped for multiple unit use on Shaker Heights, but never saw service there. The TTC struck it rich in 1952. These almost new cars became available because American transit companies were convinced to buy General Motors buses. Coxwell cars looped on the southeast corner of Danforth and Coxwell beside a small combination waiting room, variety store, and ticket agency for the highway coaches leaving the city. The Coxwell line was the East End's major streetcar connection between the Queen Line and the Bloor Danforth line. After rush hours and on weekends, service was combined with the Kingston Road streetcar to Bingham Loop. The cars were signed Kingston Road Coxwell, and the route had its own separate transfer. At the end of their runs, cars would enter the ladder track on Hillingdon Avenue and be assigned to a specified yard track. King and Harvard cars going into service exited onto Coxwell from the west end of the yard and proceeded west on Danforth to their respective routes. Coxwell was such a short route that they followed the tradition of the Bernie cars by just displaying the two Coxwell signs as route and destination for runs in both directions. It was at this location back in the 1930s that Whitcar 2956 was destroyed by fire after colliding with a gasoline truck. In the era of small businesses, before shopping plazas and mega stores, local residents had their choice of shopping at a variety of stores along the Danforth, 
including the famous five and dime stores Woolworths and Kresge's, located west of Woodbine on the north side. Carlton Cars at one time shared Luttrell Loop with the Bloor Danforth Cars, but with the increased service on both lines, congestion became too great and a new off-street loop was built on Main Street just north of Danforth in 1955 for Carlton Cars. When the Main Street subway station was built in 1966, a large loop for Carlton Cars was incorporated into the station design. opened by the TTC in 1921. Originally a simple loop on the corner, it was relocated and considerably enlarged on private right-of-way south of Danforth Avenue. A long covered platform was built for direct interchange with various suburban bus routes. The arrangement of the track enabled shed men to uncouple MU trains at the end of the PM rush hour. Like Jane Loop, one or two guides were always stationed on the platform in the AM, selling tickets and generally assisting the crews in loading the cars. A small variety store was located at the end of the platform and it was always a relief for an operator to dash in to buy a cup of coffee or a sandwich before starting up on the 65 minute trip to Jane. Unlike Jane Loop, there were no great coach facilities located here. Passengers for Ajax and Oshawa boarded coaches on the street. The nearest ticket agency was at Coxwell and Danforth. One time I was on the second car and had just purchased a cup of coffee. Placing it on the dash, I was adjusting my transfers when the operator accelerated out of the loop, sending the coffee flying into the step well. It took a couple of stops before the coffee drained off the steps. the TTC streetcar system was governed under the Railway Act. This meant that streetcar operators were not required to carry driver's licenses. While they had to obey the rules of the road, they still had to exercise good judgment while operating their cars. Several weeks before the end of Bloor Danforth streetcar service, fans came from all over to ride the routes which were to be abandoned. A number of fan clubs organized charters to cover most of the system which was to be abandoned. On the final day of streetcar operation on the Bloor Danforth line, I was doing my usual crew on a multiple unit train. Nothing out of the ordinary occurred as most local fans chose to ride the night cars into their car houses. And at seven o'clock, I ran my car into the Danforth yard for the very last time. <laughs> 